I'm Tommaso Poggio, and uh, you probably have seen on the website uh, already the title of the class, otherwise you probably would not be here. And uh, um, instructors are the most important part of the course. Let's see if we have them. Carlo, stand up. And uh, Giorgios, where's Giorgios? There. Um, Max, over there. And Ben, yeah, back there on him. And uh, Steve, and uh, Steve is at Interspeech in Germany, I think. Anyway, Owen, Owen, Owen is over there. And uh, Tommaso Poggi is here. Lorenzo, uh, the most important of all, will be here in three weeks. Um, time of the class is uh, one. Okay, I thought one thirty. So, but uh, um, tentatively, we have uh, office hours. Is Friday two three correct or okay? CBCL lounge is fifth floor upstairs, and you have the email contact. Um, so today I'll give you a brief introduction to the course and then I'll start the real stuff which is um, I'll do hopefully 30% uh, of class two. And then uh, on Monday we'll finish class two and then we have uh, math camps. So these are not uh, necessary for everybody, but it's a refreshment in what you need to know in terms of mathematical background for this class. Um, so it will be linear algebra uh, and uh, a little bit of functional analysis and probability theory. And uh, Carlo and uh, Charlie will take care of this. Um, the functional analysis up there is a little bit to scare you. Too many people in the room. Are you scared? <laughs> OK. Um, what we want to do, as you read on the website, is uh, um, a course of machine learning, mainly on uh, um, understanding the theory underlying it. If you are interested just in using code available on the web, uh, don't bother coming here. Um, I can put a w good word with uh, some company like DeepMind of Google. But uh, um, I think if you are really interested in using machine learning or it really understanding how it works or contributing to developments, then uh, this background in theory is important. And uh, so the first uh, part of the course will focus on the uh, foundations of machine learning, basic concepts like predictivity and generalization and conditions for ensuring those things. Um, and then on a broad class of algorithms that go under the name of regularization. Um, and a lot of applications after these first nine classes on, of these algorithms and developments of it. Um, and this is all the support vector machine, manifold learning, multitask. Um, and underlying this, and we have a couple of classes on it, it's of course optimization, which is critical for all approaches in machine learning. We're trying to minimize prediction error. Um, and then we have a, a final part, which is on uh, um, hierarchical techniques um, like deep learning networks. And uh, here, we'll, we'll try to 
begin a, a theory of this, which is still missing, of how to go beyond the classical theory, which is really restricted to one hidden layer networks to multiple layers. <coughs> so please interrupt any moment. Uh, I think discussions are the most important part of a class. Uh, you can always read the rest or, or review the slides. So don't, don't hesitate to interrupt. Um, rules of the game, we have two problem sets um, um, that you have to do at home, so to speak. And uh, we have a final project. And uh, the date for you to choose it will be November 25th. Um, grading is based on uh, you know how well you do in the problem sets on the final project and participating, coming to the class. Um, please fill the form that has been distributed, Carl. Yeah, afterwards, and um, send us email if you want to be added to the mailing list. Um, these are dates for problem set and uh, final class, Giorgio. So really important about the form that Tom just mentioned. We have it electronically on the web, so if you go on the, the main page of the website, there's a registration form, there's a Google Docs form. Please, all of you, either if you're taking the course for free or if you're auditing the course, just fill in your, your info there. And it's really important for you to get on the mailing list and to, to keep track of who is for the course. And also in terms of participation, every week we have a sign-in seat, so you can each, we have to sign in yeah. So if we fill out the form, will we get added to the mailing list, or should yes. we also email sure, sure. Okay. If you're filling the form, you can get added on the mailing list yeah. automatically. So please do that, all of you, either if you're taking the course for free or you're not taking the course. Good. Um, any question about this? Um, about final project, um, last year was only, uh, almost only Wikipedia project. In other words, you were asked to um, write or edit a Wikipedia entry on a topic of machine learning. Like think broadly a topic corresponding to one of the classes. Or, and, uh, um, but this year, in addition to that, we have also, you can choose um, contributing to problems for each chapter or for one chapter of a textbook for the class. You will get a draft, an electronic draft of this textbook, it's not yet published is still in a state of a draft. Anyway, there are different chapters corresponding to the topics of the class. And um, if you can cont help us in uh, you know, having problems for each chapter, that would be great. This is part, you know, contributing a, a couple or more of problems would be a project. Then uh, there is this uh, software, a toolbox for regularized least square learning, and again, contributing um, additional pieces of it is a project. Uh, you'll be, um, details about it are on the website, or we, we, we'll put a link, yeah. God bless you. Um, or uh, a research project of your choice. This could be um, essentially, for instance, testing, running some simulations, or proving some interesting theorems, or something in between. And uh, it uh, could be a topic that you come up with, or you can ask for suggestions to the TAs. Um, if you come up with it, of course, we sh you should discuss it with the TAs and decide together whether it's OK. We had uh, quite a few 
Wikipedia contributions in the last few years. Um, are, are they on the website? Yeah, so you can have a look. Um, again, we'll say something more in a few weeks, probably towards the mid of the end of October. There are some of these entries that need some update or editing and uh, um, there are more that could be written and we come up with suggestions but in the meantime you can also think about it and s you can suggest. Okay, um, warnings, the pace of the class is fast. The if you are careful in listening, the big picture of the course will be given today and then again um, towards the end of the course. Uh, there will be a lot of material and um, you know this is partly a joke but uh, we assume some uh, basic um, background in uh, certainly linear algebra and uh, signal processing. Okay, now, um, this is what I'll do in the first part of today. It's, uh, first of all, quickly motivations for why machine learning, then uh, um, a very brief um, overview of the topics relevant in the course of statistical learning theory, just to give a theoretical background, and then uh, some fun with images of uh, success stories of the last uh, uh, few years in machine learning and uh, what's going on exciting right now, especially in connection, the connection between um, machine learning and neuroscience. <coughs> so, um, I think it's a golden age for AI and started in this century, I guess, at the beginning, so 10 years or so ago. Um, I think uh, um, the problem in of intelligence is not only one of the great problems in science, like uh, the problem of the origin of the universe or the origin of life or the structure of time and space, um, but I think personally is the greatest of all these great problems. And the reason is because the, if we make any progress in understanding what intelligence is, in uh, replicating it, if we make any progress in this direction, then we'll make ourselves smarter, or we'll have machines that make ourselves think better, which is happening in fact, and this will help us solve all other problems, great problems. So that's why I think is the greatest one. You can argue with me, it'll be fun, but uh, I think the only competitor is a uh, longevity forever, becoming immortal, because this will also give you time. But, uh, uh, but it's certainly a great problem it, and it's, uh, I find fascinating, exciting that um, it's uh, a magic time in which you can do great science and also great technology and make a lot of money. You know, it's all of this together, depending on what you like. But it's all, all there. Um, and so... Um, this is, by the way, why we started two years ago this uh, Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines here. Uh, I'm the director of it, and it's really um, this uh, old dream of trying to understand the mind, trying to understand the brain, reproduce it in machines. It's very ambitious, but we think we can make some progress, and, uh, and um, you can see from the people there, this is a combination of computer science, uh, like for instance, uh, uh, you can see, let's see, Leslie Valiant somehow is missing up there, but Patrick Winston, computer scientist, and people like uh, 
Ed Boyd and Bob De Simone, neuroscientists and cognitive scientists like uh, Josh Tenenbaum and Nancy Kenwisher. Oh, Leslie Valiant is up on the Harvard side. Right. And, uh, and as I said, this is science and technology. For instance, some of our industrial partners are the usual suspects here, like uh, Microsoft and IBM and General Electric and uh, Google um, and some of the startups like DeepMind and Boston Dynamics who are now part of, uh, I think Google looked at what we, the partners we had and they bought them very quickly. Um, and, uh, um, and in all of this, in uh, what we are doing in CBMM, um, of course learning and machine learning is a as a key part, because I think that learning is really, um, it's not the all of intelligence, but it's a very important part of it. And uh, understanding it, it's a key for understanding intelligence. So, um, um, this is just repeating what I was saying, and why Machine learning is interesting these days. Um, and uh, let me just to give you a, a background, uh, some feeling about the structure, not background, uh, some feeling about the structure of the class, of the course. This uh, first ten, nine classes are really the, the old core of it, are the foundations of the theory and uh, the basic uh, class of algorithms used to solve, um, to approach learning from data, uh, supervised learning, which is regularizations. And then uh, the, this class from 10 to 20 are essentially state of the art topics in research in machine learning going on today and applications of machine learning to various to a variety of problems. And then the, the final um, uh, six classes are about essentially deep learning and the relations also to uh, sensory cortex. Now, just to give you some feeling about um, uh, the theory itself, um, We'll mainly look at supervised learning. This is the simplest, cleanest, not the only one, form of learning in which you are given <coughs> a set of data and can be very large. And each element of it is a pair, is an input-output pair. Input is a vector, x. Y can be a vector, but often is in the case of classification, is just a binary number, 0 or 1, correct or incorrect. And so you'd like to find a black box that, given this set of data, learns this mapping from the input space to the output space. And learns means that when it's given a new x, it will provide a correct y or a an approximation for a correct y. Um, of course, if x is one of the xi, then you have a, it's a memory, it's a lookup table, not very interesting. You want more than that. Um, and so that's the difference between curve fitting and prediction. You know, you have some points, x, this is just one dimensional case for x. In general, x is um, often a vector with many uh, components, but in this case, it's just one for the sake of visualization. And the output y is a number, and these are the places where you have data. And prediction means <coughs> that you, you should be able, f after you have seen this data, your algorithm should be able to predict the correct y for a new x. 
And you can see immediately that's not easy under, uh, without additional constraints because there are many, many, many curves, an infinite number that fit exactly the data but are different elsewhere. By the way, this is uh, what is called regression, when uh, uh, your output is the real number. And classification is when your output is a label out of a discrete set. For it's a binary classification. In this case, it's a person. It's not a person. Um, this would be a binary classification case. Now, a, a lot of the foundations of statistical learning theory have been uh, um, established during the last uh, 30 years or so by uh, mathematicians like uh, Leslie Valiant, in particular Vladimir Vapnik and Steve Smail, um, um, which really linked uh, machine learning of the form of learning we'll speak about in the class to classical mathematics, function analysis, and so on. So um, mathematicians don't like statistics, typically. And uh, um, this form of statistical learning, the, despite its statistical component in the title, is not really statistics. It's real mainstream mathematics. I'll tell you in a few minutes in uh, uh, what is class two, um, the basic setup for supervised learning. Also because this will be a test for you whether you how much you need math camps. Um, but this is the kind of definitions that we need in order to um, set up the basic uh, results and properties of um, in learning theory. We we'll deal with um, functions and function spaces that we'll call hypothesis spaces. We'll uh, look at uh, learning algorithms as, as maps between uh, data sets and hypothesis spaces, and um, we'll, uh, um, we'll speak about basic concepts like predictivity and, <coughs> gener and generalization. Um, we'll also, there is a result which I think is quite important that links predictivity with uh, the ability of an algorithm to predict from data the correct answer. This property, which is of course basic for machine learning, will link this to a, a property of well-posedness. In mathematics, a problem is well-posed if the solution exists, is unique and stable. And uh, usually, the problem of classical problem of physics are well posed. For instance, solving the heat equation. You know, if you start with an initial distribution of heat and you let diffuse, the solution exists, uh, is unique, it turns out is stable, you perturb the initial conditions, the <coughs> result of it will change not very much. But typically, all inverse problems, not always, but all inverse problems are ill-posed. So for instance, inverting the heat equation after the heat and diffuse trying to reconstruct the original source is typically not well-posed. Um, and a lot of problems that are interesting in these last decades, I would say, in science and technology, things like radar, scattering, uh, predicting the weather, all of these things are typically inverse problems and ill-posed. Okay. Now, there is this interesting link between uh, learning theory, the, the need of generalization, and, 
and uh, um, well posedness. And it's interesting because in the I'll show you it's an equivalence. And this tells us immediately that a way to solve the problem of predictivity is to use the same approach that scientists have used for um, ill-posed problems. And this is a regularization. You can show that the general approach for, for making a ill-posed problem well-posed is to regularize it. And I'll explain what this means. It's basically constraining the solution in a, in a certain general way. And by the way, uh, this idea, of, uh, these definitions of well posed and ill posed goes back to Hadamar in 1900. And the heat equation and inverting the heat equation was exactly the example he used. Um, some of the results we'll just touch upon on uh, learning theory have um, really some deep implications, I find. It's fascinating, maybe not practical implications, but philosophical one, yes. For instance, um, if you think about what it means to be, is for a problem or in a field to be scientific, it means that you can predict the future. That's, you know, classical mechanics say um, you can predict how given um, a body, some boundary conditions, how an apple will fall from the tree, right? So, um, so the fact that you, you can predict, that you can generalize from data is really what science is about. Compare astronomy with astrology. You know, they both explain the data, but astrology does not predict. Um, look f for the financial pages of any respectable journal, like the Wall Street Journal or, you know, the Financial Times. They basically say, oh, the market went down today because people were afraid. Okay, try to use this information to predict what the market will do tomorrow. Good luck, right? So these are, these are not scientific. These are, uh, are just fitting the data, uh, explaining perhaps, but without the power to predict the future. That's what science is about. So from this point of view, you know, economics is probably not a science. Um, again, we can argue about it. Uh, and there is this interesting metaphor, you know, how does um, a, a, a field, a theory, manage to be predictive, scientific? Um, um, essentially, it's Occam razor. You have to produce a theory from data, but you have to produce it, so you, the model that you have to come up with um, is based on the data, but has to be chosen for a restricted set. You cannot see the data and see the prediction and change your theory all the time, right? It has to be, there must be some finite, uh, not finite, but some, some set of hypotheses out of you which, based on the data, you choose the theory. And uh, otherwise, you can overfit, explain any data if you don't have these constraints. And this is, it turns out, this is what allow, in fact, predictivity to, to happen, your algorithms to be predictive. Um, So the kind of things that uh, people have used for solving ill-posed problems or making them well-posed are techniques called the regularization. And a form of it, we'll, I'll say more in class two, but a form of it for machine learning 
is what is called Tikhonov regularization, which is essentially m finding the function out of a set of functions. So think of it as a hypothesis, is the set of possible models of theories. Find the function that minimizes the error of the training set. So for each xi, the f predicts a certain uh, y, and you look, um, you have the correct y because that's your training set. You compute the error. So this v is just a measure of error, like for it's a square error. There are other ones um, between f of xi and yi. Um, so it's trying to minimize in that error. But there is a constraint. It's subject to some, con some conditions on f. For instance, how smooth f is. This uh, um, will we'll show this in the class. This is a norm in a reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, which is the characterized by a certain function k, which is symmetric and positive definite. For now, think of it, for instance, like a Gaussian, a Gaussian of x minus xi square. Okay, that's an example of a kernel, and uh, and it turns out that the solution of this minimization problem has always this form: is the linear combination with coefficient certain coefficient alpha i of in this case, this Gaussian centered in each one of the xi. And uh, um, how you find the alpha i is by minimizing, by learning. So this is learning means finding the alpha i that minimize that there with this form of the solution. And depending on the v and the k, this includes old classical technique like splines, cubic splines, linear splines that have been used for many decades to um, interpolate and approximate data points, especially in one dimension, or radial basis function, or support vector machines, and so on. All, all of this is basically coming out of this way to making a problem, the learning problem well posed, and therefore the learning problem able to generalize and predict. Yes. How does the schema model uncertainty? Sorry? With this scheme of learning, how does this model uncertainty imagine if we wanted to, if uh, we want our machine to be able to say, I don't know? Yeah, this does not, in this framework, explicitly model uncertainty. There are various ways to estimate confidence of your result, but by itself, it does not. This. In fact, you can show that this form corresponds to, um, in a sense, a more general uh, formulation in terms of probabilities. And um, so there is a Bayesian interpretation of this. And um, this essentially corresponds to having a prior on the space of function, which is a Gaussian prior, which has a form like e to the minus norm of f. And, and this, that one will be the, the maximum a posteriori uh, estimate of f in the Bayesian framework. So in the Bayesian, the Bayesian framework will be more general, will give you also some explicit you know, measure of uncertainty. Um, but, um, but you have always this trade-off. The general approach, the Bayesian approach is more general hammer, and therefore maybe attractive because it's more general and it's simple. But um, since it's so general, it's not very powerful. Um, this, uh, this approach is essentially, instead of trying to answer everything, is trying to tell you um, to answer 
the really important part of the qu your question, like you know, classification. Um, one important thing I want to mention is that this um, very general solution to this regularization problem corresponds to network one hidden layer. You know, you, you can always rewrite an equation in terms of a graph. In this case, the map is very simple. You have uh, inputs. In this case, x has two components. Here you have units in the network, which are really computing. This is a measure of similarity between the input x and each one of the xi. Each one of the unit has stored x1, x2, x3, so the old set of the input part of the training data. And then when a new input comes in, each unit computes this, which is, for instance, the Gaussian of the Euclidean distance between x and x1, the Gaussian of the Euclidean distance between x and xn. And then those are weighted with the alpha i and summated together here. So you have this direct uh, um, uh, interpretation in terms of one hidden layer networks. Um, but we want to, and this is the, the last classes in the course, trying to understand how to deal with, uh, from the theory point of view, with networks like this one. This is the one that performed very well in 2012 on ImageNet. Um, and these are uh, more recent ones. I think this is Microsoft and Google Net, and this is the one, uh, um, the one from Cicerman or so, that also did very well. So these are many layers, not just one hidden layer. Similar in terms of operations, but uh, and we, we, we'll see it. So. OK, um, you know, just uh, it's again related to your question. Um, we are really dealing with this part. These are kind of two strands in learning theory today. One is the probabilistic Bayesian approach. The other one is the sometimes called discriminative approach, uh, regularization for vector machines and so on. And the first one is statistics. The second one is mainly functional analysis. Um, um, OK. I would say in the last uh, year or so, especially or two years or more, uh, or actually 15 years, this is the one that uh, is, um, has better performance in practical applications. But the future. We'll, s we'll say more about it. So let me let's see what time is it. The watch there is not really very accurate. OK. So um, let me start with work uh, in my group 25 years ago when we started to do face detection using machine learning for, for detecting faces. So systems that were trained with, at the time, a lot of examples, like 200. <laughs> um, now, now, you know, ImageNet has one million examples or so. Um, and um, you know, the system was working pretty well. But you can see immediately some of the Of course, you have face detection with your camera. And um, then we did pedestrian detection, people detection. I mentioned that in uh, earlier. And um, um, yeah, so we have. Um, Uh, 
these are all examples, one way or the other, of machine learning. This is uh, DeepMind, DeepQ. This is a system that learns uh, to play Atari games and uh, playing by against itself, learns by itself, and uh, I think 40 plus Atari games, and um, is better than humans at most of it. Um, this is a, a um, recent article, uh, re recent special issue on machine learning in nature, mainly about deep learning. Um, this was a system we had This was uh, 20 years ago. It was a project with Daimler. Uh, this is a video from a Mercedes with the computer in the trunk. 20 years ago, the system was trained to detect pedestrians. And you can see there are some false detection. At the time, we were very happy. It was a mistake, a very free frames. And now, now there is this company of uh, an ex postdoc of mine, I'm not Shashua, the company is called Mobileye. It's on the stock market. It has machine learning, learning to detect cars and pedestrians and other, other obstacles. You can have it as an option on the Volvo. This is an advertisement for the Volvo. You can get a discount on your insurance if you have the system. <laughs> 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 because the system really works. Um, and, uh, you know, this is more recent. Uh, With automated driving, we are taking our core capabilities of visual understanding to the next level, where the degree of details required to support self-driving cars grows by leaps and bounds. If you buy a Tesla, end of this year. In addition to preventing collisions, the system must sense the road at great details, including lane markings, curves, barriers, obstructions, recognize a large vocabulary of uh, traffic signs and traffic lights, and be And this is... Uh, Hi, I'm Liat, and I'm visually impaired. I want to show you today how this device changed my life. It's another company in Israel. Great, let's go there. Red light. Green light. This is for people who don't have uh, good vision, like background degeneration. Let's buy some coffee. And the system can read uh, text that we can Breakfast. Bagel plus coffee with cream cheese, croissant, yogurt, grain with fresh fruit. Okay. Uh, in fact, we had a summer school of our center that finished just a week ago in Woodsall. And uh, I think uh, both, uh, both Demis Asabis, who is the CEO of uh, DeepMind, and Amnon Shashua came to speak. They both were postdoc in my group here in this building. Um, so yeah, these are other, a lot of other application of machine learning. J this is just to say there are a lot of applications from computer vision to computer graphics to speech recognition, speech synthesis, bioinformatics, detecting and uh, diagnosis, detection diagnosis of cancer to finance, like uh, pricing uh, derivative uh, securities, like uh, options. Um, and so on. Um, there are a lot of applications, and those are some of the few that we have been doing over the last few decades. Um, the, 
One application, for instance, is decoding the neural code, essentially kind of a matrix type application in which you record the neural activity from the brain of a monkey and in real time you can say from the neural activity what the monkey is looking at. Um, and you use machine learning to do that, um, but I'll skip it because, uh, because of time. We may s um, so let me go through quickly here. Um, I want to show you a couple of old but interesting applications in computer graphics. Um, so the, the standard computer vision problem is, is um, let me, uh, I think I went to one slide too quick. So the standard um, vision, computer vision problem or vision problem, what we call analysis, you have an image, you want to estimate something about it, like the object there is a beer, or maybe the pose, you know, frontal side view. And you may be able to do that in machine learning by training a system with a lot of input images, the X, XI, and the corresponding YI. But suppose I train a system with the op I exchange XI with YI. Okay. So now I have a pose, for instance, and a corresponding image. Now this is graphics. The output is an image. Um, and here is an application of several years ago together with a very gifted student at the Media Lab. Oops, let me see if I can. This is a prototype system for creating character drawings based on example drawings entered by the user. This first example shows four images of Garfield's head with two different expressions, smiling and... Just a sec. In the meantime, if you have questions... Yeah. Uh, you said uh, restricting the hypothesis space leads to more predictivity. Yeah. What is the reason? Like, what's the logical uh, reason in the procedure that by just making the hypothesis space simpler or smaller? It's not that you can make it simpler or smaller in an arbitrary way. Um, I'll give you some example. It's a kind of, so in terms of the intuition is that you cannot have, so to speak, an infinite pool of possible models out of which you, 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 given the data, you can choose. It has to be constrained in some way. And, uh, um, you know, the mathematics tells you how and why. Um, um, you can think about the example I made, and I'll go through it, um, of a function in one dimension going through points, right? You have to restrict in some way the class of functions. For instance, it turns out that a continuous function is not enough. It's not enough of a restriction. But a smooth function is. Now, why smooth is OK? And and, uh, you know, continuous is not, it's, um, okay, there is some intuition, but there is where the mathematics come in.
Okay, I think I have it. Happy to sad. And rotate the head from front to side. Oh. Wait. <laughs> I spoke too early. Um. Other interfaces are also provided. Here, sketch recognition is used to create a new image. The user simply draws a rough sketch of the face they would like to see, and it appears automatically. This interface allows anyone to create professional looking drawings, even if they have no drawing experience. generated, the user can still make small changes to wait, it using wait. the sliders until they are happy with the displayed face. This is a prototype system for creating character drawings based on example drawings entered by the user. This first example shows four images the of Garfield's head interface can also be used to make simple animation scripts. The user draws several rough sketches in This is a prototype system for creating character drawings based on example drawings entered by the user. This first example shows four images of Garfield's head with two different expressions, smiling and frowning, as seen from the front and the side views. I'm able to interpolate in between these four drawings to create new images that aren't in the original database. Here, the top slider is controlling changes in expression from happy to sad, while the bottom slider controls changes in rotation from front to side. Unlike traditional animation systems that allow interpolation in only one dimension, this system allows the user to interpolate in multiple dimensions. Here, I'm mixing characteristic features together to create a new half-rotated, half-happy Garfield. To create a new example base, the user first scans in a bitmap image of a character drawing. The important features of the drawing are trait. Skip this. Here is the completed example base, consisting of ten images sorted into four categories. The user can interactively control the width of the mouth, make the mouth open and close change the expression of the face from happy to sad, and rotate the head from front to side. These categories can be combined to generate hundreds of images from just 10 original examples. This next example shows eight images of a cartoon face sorted into three categories. The head can be rotated from front to side. The shape of the face can be squashed and stretched. And the mouth can be opened and closed. 
Normally, sliders are used to control the character, but other interfaces are also provided. Okay. Here, sketch recognition is used to create a new image. The user simply draws a rough sketch of the face they would like to see, and it appears automatically. Now, this was, um, this was um, a long time ago. I think it was 93 or so. So, you know, today this seems a bit tame, but it was one uh, of the first uh, applications of radial basis function to computer graphics and other came. Uh, this is, for instance, synthesizing a 3D face from just one image. You can, uh, if you have a database of um, 200 people who are not Tom Hanks, then uh, from a single image of Tom Hanks, you can fit essentially a combina linear combination of these 300, 200 faces and have a pretty good 3D Tom Hanks, at which point you can play a lot of games, like changing illumination or pose or making him fatter or whatever. Um, same with Audrey Hepburn. Um, I'll show you. More news in a moment. This other system, which um, essentially is synthesizing a video. So you, the input is a piece of speech. The output is a video of this uh, girl, Mary, um, that says those words. The words are real. The video is synthetic. Um, so this is the system uh, developed with Tony Edzett, and um, it uh, learns how um, this girl speaks in terms of facial movements. And so given a, a new piece of speech, it can produce a synthetic um, video of her speaking those words, even if she never did. Um, With one light on and one room, I know you're up. When I get so she home, cannot sing, but. with one small, <laughs> with one light on, and one room, I know you're up. When I get home, with one small step upon the stair, she can do it in another language. Chinese. <laughs> with one light on, you can make very morose and things you never did. I know you're up when I get home. The training set was with more one small the step upon the um, and uh, this is Katie Couric. This probably you don't know her. This was many years ago. From New York, not from the beaches of. So let's see if. Uh, oops. From. Ah. From. Okay. In from New York, not from the beaches of Cannes, TV news legend Walter Cronkite. He'll be hosting this year's 61st annual George Foster so Peabody Award ceremony on Kuhn, Monday. We'll talk with him about now. that. And uh, The new technology can take anyone's voice, including mine, and by reprocessing it through a computer, my voice can sound and look as if it's coming out of someone else's mouth. So these were the voice of... Rahima Ellis, NBC News, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and New York. So this was Rahima Ellis, um, but it's very 101 sp speaking what Rahima Ellis said. And Rahima is this one. Ooh, you kiss it. So you never sang this way.
The meeting was frank. The meeting was frank. So one of the sentences is real, the other 53 one is percent. 53 percent. More news in a moment. More news in a moment. It's a matter of money. It's a matter of money. That's all for tonight. That's all for tonight. It could take months. It could take months. So if we show it to naive observers, um, most of the people cannot distinguish between the real and the synthetic one. Of course, you can if the sentences are longer. But uh, in this case, brief one, the, the result was around 50%. So in a sense, is you know, the system passed this restricted Turing test of uh, it's real, it's synthetic. Um, so, you know, on this topic, let me finish this part, is uh, we have this system that can pass restricted Turing tests. For instance, on this one, of producing videos that look real for speech or uh, you know, driving a car or um, uh, winning a Jeopardy or winning a chess. But we don't know yet how to produce a system that can answer all the m many, almost infinite number of questions you can ask about an image like this. You know, you can ask, who is there? What is she doing? Uh, but, um, you know, you, you can ask, uh, many, many things. Um, and, uh, um, and this is actually a limitation of standard supervised learning because you cannot imagine that there is something in our brain, you know, there is a classifier trained for each of the possible questions that you can ask. Right? So, so that's kind of future challenges. Um, and uh, these are the kind of things that we have in the center. That we should keep uh, the back of our mind this class is, uh, you know, how uh, the human brain can uh, um, answer all this question about an image, if you are interested in vision, that we call Turing plus plus question, because we would like to answer them in terms of a system, an algorithm that answer them as we do, but also tell us um, how the brain does it in terms of the circuits involved in it. So I was, um, I was hoping to be able to, um, this is an example of a workshop we had just a few days ago here. It's about one of these questions about uh, face recognition, how the brain learns to do face recognition and the circuits underlying it is one of the uh, question you can ask about an image, the who is question that we are closer to answer in terms of machine learning algorithms that the brain may use and in terms of the related circuits in the brain, uh, in the brain of the monkey, which is for vision quite similar to our own brain. But um, related, very closely related to this kind of question is, uh, as I mentioned, the theory of systems like this. This is, by the way, a model that we had several years ago about uh, um, information processing in cortex, simple complex cells in V1, V2, V3, V4, various areas in cortex. And um, there is also this multi-layer not just one hidden layer structure like in these deep learning networks. And the question both for our cortex and for deep learning is why? What is a theory that could explain it, that could extend the classical theory th uh, that deals with one layer networks? Um, we'll see some of this. Um, and I'll also in the last few classes and uh, also um, want to mention that uh, an interesting 
reason why I'm uh, um, now much more in favor or, uh, of deep learning as models of the brain is uh, not only their performance, they're doing very well in uh, practical problems, um, um, and of course, I'm very curious about why hierarchies are important, or may be important. Um, but it's because, because of this. So it's again, so I always thought that the main problem with deep learning, like the models used to classify ImageNet, you've certainly heard about it, um, was was not so much the deep architecture, but the fact that they need millions of labeled examples. It's really like an extreme version of supervised learning. Your training set must be very large. And uh, it seems biologically implausible when uh, a child learns to, I don't know, to recognize objects, to recognize cars. It's not that you show the child one million time this picture, this is a car, this is not a car, this is a car, this is not a car. This is, by the way, what Mobile Eye is doing. They have a team of people in Sri Lanka, I think, labeling images by hand. You know, if you think about computer science, this is a parenthetical comment. It used to be that you programmers, programmers were doing most of the work. And now, with machine learning, you have uh, labelers doing most of the work. You still, <laughs> you still need humans, only you pay them much less. Um, but um, so I, I thought that this was really the main reason why I was biologically implausible. But, but there is a, 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 a possible way out, which is um, that you, you may not need, for instance, during development, early years of development of a child, you may not need to have explicit labels. You know, if, if I, I look at you, I don't know your name, but there is no big discontinuities and you are uh, X, person X, and I get several examples of you, several views, right? So there is this implicit labeling that could happen based on simple heuristics like time continuity or some kind of bootstrapping. And so you may not need explicit labeling. Uh, and by the way, this is interesting for biology, but this idea of uh, implicit labeling, heuristics that ensure that, is um, also possibly an interesting uh, area for research. Because uh, if you could avoid a lot of this labeling, have system that can do that automatically, not for all data, but for a significant fraction of it, that would be a big win. And so this is an interesting one. This ILEs, implicitly labeled examples, um, could be an interesting, for instance, project, if any one of you is interested in a project in the class. Um, OK. So um, you know, all of this is really, that I think, the next frontier. and. You know, one of the things we'll be looking towards the end of the, of the class, of the course, is uh, what may be a next phase in machine learning, which is going from the framework of big data, tons of supervised examples, tons of labeler, labelers and labeled examples, n is the number of examples, n going to infinity. That's the f current framework, successful, that will be successful for a while to a phase which is more biological, in which you don't need explicit labels. Uh, um, ideally, you'd like to learn from one single example, one single image. And a lot of it is um, su unsupervised or implicitly supervised. Now, um, see, I, I think uh, my uh, plans of starting class two are unfortunately um, don't work, so we'll do it next Monday. Um, let me finish here 
And uh, if you have any questions, um, I'm here and all the people, yeah, the, the TAs are here. And uh, you should fill the, the forms. Yeah, they do the Okay, very good. Thank you.